Appalachian Mountains, one of the most magical places in America. Few places can compare to the beauty of the trees in the fall as they reveal their true colors. And each spring when they're reborn. There are over 158 different species of trees that number in the billions in these mountains, the most diverse ecosystem in America. Tragically, there's one tree that is missing from this ecosystem, and just a hundred years ago, it was the king of these mountains. That tree was the American chestnut. That's right, just a hundred years ago, the chestnut tree made up 25% of all trees in Appalachia, and on the virgin mountain ridges, nearly 100% of the trees were chestnut, towering over 130 feet tall and 14 feet in diameter. These trees lived to be up to 800 years old. They were the giants of the forest. All the animals and the people of these mountains depended on this tree for its plentiful bounty of chestnuts each fall and for the medicinal properties found in its leaves and its bark and the lumber to build their homes, barns, fences, and bridges. It was rot resistant and lasted hundreds of years. Suddenly, in just a few short years, all the chestnuts were gone, all four billion of them. Even today, it remains the greatest ecological disaster in the history of planet Earth. So what really happened? Well, my friend, I'm glad you asked. And this is the true story of the American chestnut tree. Long before the earliest pioneers ever reached Appalachia, Native Americans regarded the chestnut tree as one of the most valuable resources in the mountains. Archaeological records and oral histories reveal that the tribes from southern Canada to Georgia, from Maine to the Ohio River Valley, and beyond, actively managed these forests to favor and encourage the growth of the chestnut tree. Reaching heights as tall as a 12-story building, the natives referred to the chestnut as the grandfather of the forest. The Cherokee Indians referred to it as the bread tree because they ground the nuts and the flour for bread making. Indeed, it dominated over 200 million acres of Appalachia. Each spring, after the last frost, the chestnut would bloom large white flowers, so many flowers that the entire tops of the Appalachian Mountains looked like they were covered in snow. These flowers would turn into spiny burrs during the summer. By the first frost of autumn, the burrs would split open, revealing the high-protein, delicious, sweet nut that would fall to the ground. On any windy fall day, a tremendous harvest would fall to the forest floor that would be several inches deep in chestnuts. For thousands of years, the chestnut tree provided food, shelter, medicine, tools, implements, and more to the native communities and the food for nearly all of the animals of the forest. The chestnut's importance is written in the stories and the legends from every Native American tribe east of the Mississippi River. Now, by the time the Scot-Irish and the German settlers began arriving in Appalachia, it was a land of make it do, make it yourself, or do without. But the one thing that made life easier in the mountains for these pioneers was the chestnut tree. The wood was lightweight and strong, brownish yellow in color, with grain that was similar to that of an oak tree. Now, because of its high resistance to decay, it made long-lasting split-rail fences, fence posts, log cabins, and shingles, and mine timbers, telegraph poles, and railroad ties. It also made sturdy beams for barns and homes, as well as beautiful furniture and paneling. The wood also made excellent lump charcoal for firing iron furnaces. After the trees were cut for making charcoal, they would quickly re-sprout from the stump and grew back. The chestnut fed them 
It fattened their stock and warmed their fireplaces. It cooked their cornbread and bought all their luxuries, their goods, their pearl-handled pistols and snuff. Now, the more children you had, the more chestnuts you could gather and roast on the hearth on a winter night or you could haul by wagon to the market to be shipped all across America. Big cities like New York City, oh, they couldn't get enough of the chestnut. In fact, they considered it the first fast food. A young boy in Appalachia could quickly pick up enough to buy his own shoes or clothes or a rag doll or any other play pretty for selling chestnuts in a valley town. Hogs that were fattened on chestnuts were walked down the mountain in droves of hundreds. There was no better firewood. You see, chestnut logs kept an even heat all night, and they didn't smoke. Blacksmiths would use it instead of coal in their forges. Chestnut lumber sealed up a house, and it made furniture that was strong and light in weight. A broth made of chestnut leaves could break up a deep down cough. The chestnut bark was also critical for tan and leather, especially in southern Appalachia. You see, it was rich in tannic acid, which softens and darkens the leather. While it's hard to imagine today, the mid-1800 tanneries were some of the largest corporations in the United States. Leather for shoes and belts and horse harnesses all required tannin from chestnut bark. One woman who never bothered with a husband used to say, A grove of chestnuts is a better provider than any man, and easier to be around, too. If you needed yourself a footbridge, you simply cut down a chestnut tree and dropped it across. The trees were stout and straight, straight as an arrow, and they never sagged. And if the floods didn't wash it away, it would last a lifetime. Now, if you nailed a board across it and stretched a wire for a handrail, you had yourself a footbridge fit for a preacher and his lady. You see, the acid in the wood halted all decay, and drainage ditches that were made of chestnuts didn't rot. Most of all, rail fences made of chestnuts fenced in your kingdom from your neighbors. Splitting rails and laying down rail fences was hard work, but it was reverent work. For this was something that you weren't only doing for your children, but for their children too. There was something about having an old chestnut rail fence. They seemed like old hands folded protectively around a place. That's right, the chestnut tree was a gift from God to the southern mountaineer. And some say that his bounty was so generous that the people were stirred to awe and almost reverence. Now, the animals felt the same way about the chestnut tree. They knew that a windy autumn day would bring food falling from the heavens like manna. People would have to get up early in the morning by a lantern light to beat the animals to the chestnuts. And when the animals got there first and ate them all, the people would climb the tree and shake the branches so that more chestnuts rained down from the sky. That's right, this mighty giant was the most important tree in Appalachia, and everybody depended on it. So, what happened? You see, in 1870, a man named S.B. Parsons imported Asian chestnuts to New York City because they were cheaper than chestnuts from Appalachia. Now, what he didn't know was that there was a deadly fungus that hitched a ride on those Asian chestnuts, and the American chestnut trees had no defense against it. By 1904, workers at the Bronx Zoo in New York noticed that suddenly all of the American chestnut trees were developing rings of dead bark and orange cankers. These trees were giants and they were nearly 700 years old. Yet, one by one, and then by the hundreds, finally, all 2,500 chestnut trees in this famous grove died. Frantically, scientists all over the world began studying this unknown fungal pathogen. And that's when they discovered it originated in China. For some reason, the Chinese trees had built up an immunity to this blight over millions of years. However, the American chestnut had never been exposed to it, and it had no resistance. Every tree that was infected was doomed. 
The blight began spreading all over New York at an alarming rate. Within one single year, every chestnut tree within a 60-mile area was dead. Researchers began cutting down chestnut trees in an effort to stop it from spreading, but it was too late. By 1905, the death zone was 120 miles wide, and each year the devastation continued. By 1911, all of the trees in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania were dead. During the 1920s, carried by the wind, the rain, and even birds' feet, the blight continued to sweep further north and south in the Appalachian Mountains. Scientists couldn't stop it. The blight traveled all across the entire Appalachian Mountain Range like a wildfire, and by 1950, every chestnut tree in Appalachia was dead. All four billion of them. All that remained were gray and ghostly skeletons of dead trees. Yet, this wasn't the end of the tragedy. And we were about to find out why the Native Americans called the chestnut tree the grandfather of the forest and the bread tree. You see, with the primary food source gone for the animals and the people of Appalachia, shock waves were sent through the entire ecological system. The population of the forest animals, bears, squirrels, and deer, and many other animals, decreased as much as 50%. Seven species of moss who ate the chestnut leaves went completely extinct. Also, seven species of butterflies went extinct. 40% of the white-footed mouse population died. And this resulted in an overpopulation of moths. The moths then feasted on other plant leaves and decimated plant populations. And sadly, the passenger pigeon, once the most abundant bird in the world, went extinct. There were no more chestnut leaves to fall to the forest floor, and the result was that the composition of the soil changed drastically, and much of the microbiotic life died. And when the soil changed, the runoff into the creeks and the rivers permanently altered aquatic life. Five invertebrate species went extinct, and many of the aquatic plants went extinct. Even the water tasted different. The Appalachian Mountains were forever altered. Many researchers argued that this was the end of the pioneer life in Appalachia. With the chestnut tree gone, many people left the mountains for good to work in factories in large urban cities, never to return. Even today, scientists note that the loss of the American chestnut tree is the greatest ecological tragedy in the history of planet Earth. <laughs>